from long ago, we, we, we took that trail from the east side of town and we went up to the north side of town. But Jim Ackerman of the Christian Society Club uh, gives an overview of the trail from the north side of Church Street to the north side of town that led to the east side. Uh, it served as an important trade route for those peoples to the, to the interior and down the east side. Tim grew up in the Chilkat Chilku country in Haines and Skagway and has devoted many years to conducting research on the trail and documenting the route through first-hand observation as well as through oral history. Uh, as he said, I've spent the past 15 to 20 years researching and retracing these routes combined with collecting oral history in the United States and Canada. I've traveled along the trails from both directions and will show photos of the existing trail, including the intersection of the Chilkat Trail approaches to Sala Lake in the Yukon Territory, where it connects with trails that go to Carcross, Champaign, and before continues along the Talpini River to Sala Lake and finally to Dawson. So, thank you, Tim, for coming down here. It's been very exciting to actually see the trail and see the the actual route to get to so thank you so much. And there will be um, people watching on YouTube can submit via uh, the chat function, can submit questions, so we'll, we'll have questions um, at the end of the talk. So thank you so much, and please remember to turn off your cell phone. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
did that help me out up there too, uh, Chuck. Chuck was uh, quite influential there on, on a lot of the history and a lot of the country. Yeah, he had been up there on the first half of the whole summer there. And, yeah, he was really good. Uh, and this was all uh, before the uh, pandemic hit. We were out putting our boots on the trail. And, uh, I, I was going to start earlier, but we had a summer season of monsoon, so all the rivers and everything was super high, so it was very unsafe to go traverse. So I had to wait one more year. And um, as I was waiting, I got a job up in the Yukon on a Yukon River with uh, a canoe camp through Plain Price, and we had a canoe that was carved out on the uh, Yukon River on an island. 
the Kusawa River into the Kusawa Lake, and then the other one is the Tahini that drops in to the Kusawa Lake about seven miles from the first trail. So we'll just go and we'll, uh, I'll explain as we go along here in the slideshow a little bit of what's going on. But uh, yeah, this first picture here is um, I'm with the Bureau of Land Management crew, the head archaeologist. Uh, him and I, he invited me up there. It's a good thing too because uh, I made a wrong turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in this particular picture, this is a Kusawa Lake right here. Um, for those of you that have been up uh, to Disney Ash Lake and seen Disney Ash Lake on the drive, what we're actually doing here is um, looking straight across in those mountain ranges with the snow on it. That's where the Alaska Highway is, and we're over that pass into Kusawa Lake. But this place in particular right here is um, very interesting. I'll explain this picture because it's really important. We have a gentleman that was probably in the 1800s or before that, that was traversing on his way back from a train up here in the, in the Yukon. And as he was going back down, he hurt his foot. He was unable to continue. So the story goes that he told his nephews that was with him, uh, just pile up a bunch of firewood for me so I can sit here and wait while you guys go back to Club Mom and you come back up and get me out you off the of so the pile of all the wood, he had all his belongings with him, and then he, uh, after the nephews left, he built the fire up and then grabbed all his belongings and jumped in. So for the longest time, this story was really, uh, in a song that goes with it, it was really interesting. And finally, talking to old timers, we found out where he was at in this place in particular is. So you're looking at the picture, but he would be to the right, there's a really nice beach there. And they had found his remains there, so they buried him around the old, old town. But, yeah, it's a really, really good song. It'll just be part of the song here. <clears throat> it's a Kakistani, but it goes, Hey! Chilcat, uh, 
Yeah, this is the morning that we're going to start you know, traversing up the Chilcat to work with our state. Okay, as we traversed up the Chilcat here, this is the first route that we went up. Um, my good friend, archaeologist John, he scoped it out with his uh, compass and said that's where we're going, to, you know, up to the north. And this is the gap we were shooting for her, but we was like 150 yards off, so we kept going over the top, and that's the Chilcat River behind it there. You can see down, that's, the, that's where we come from, Club on up. And this is just like a mile from where you can go to, to, as far as you take the boats up there. But this is the wrong, wrong uh, route here. I just let him kind of guide the way since he was in Boston. Mm -hmm. So let's see what we've got here. Yeah, it's another shot of the Chilcat River. And in our campsite to the right, it was a real prominent. It's called the uh, Turtle Rock. Let's see. Okay. Now, as we climbed up and made the ascent, we got on top of the bluff. And we hiked back in there a little ways. And before we went down this ravine, I asked him for sure, are you sure you want to go down in here? Yeah. To take the picture, I dug my heels in and laid down on the, the angle of the hill so I could slide down and snap the picture of that big granite outcropping as they made the descent. So I, I, uh, I called it the value of hell. For, for, you know, yeah. This particular picture here was uh, so thick down there that um, once we got down in the bottom of the valley, the, the dead falls and the trees and the devil clubs were seven feet over our heads. We were walking under logs that are as, as high as these, like this. It was so thick in this valley. And about halfway across, we ran out of water, and you could hear the water on the other side of the valley. So that was our, you know, we had to have water. It took us about an hour to cross the valley. And the other gentleman with us, me and the youngster, we had to do the final 100 yards of water up, up the hill of the ways and got all water. We came back down and we were good with the water. It was uh, pretty hot and dry when we you know, you run out of water. When we came back out of that valley, that was like the first day we attempted to go. And then the next, the next morning, you know, I pulled out my book and showed him. I said, here's the old trail house right here, and this is where we got to go. You know, we got to go to the east side of the river. Up to that canyon, I told him that's where the trail is. Because I've been in you know, these places when I was a young kid. So this is where we struck out this further. This is as far as you can go on the Chilcat River before you have to get out of your canoe and take the old Chilcat Trail. So that's what we did. We crossed over the canoe and hiked up to the beginning of the trail here as we go over here. Yeah, you can see we're getting closer as we're hiking up. And, uh, uh, it's quite the canyon here. And, uh, Turtle Rock is, it'll be further in the pictures here, but I'll show you that as well. <coughs> Here's what we ran into, of course, the beginning of the trail here. This is a really good uh, piece of rock here. It shows all the uh, geological processes from the way back and the uh, stage and part of it, like that river came down and cut it. But yeah, we're, we're checking this out here. It's a pretty good trail marker, if I ever seen it. So then the trail is to your right, where the gentleman with the uh, green shirt is standing. The boss, John, is uh, standing at the bottom. There's a good, another good shot up there. They are real interesting. Now here's the beginning of the Chilcat Trail. And this is where everybody would come in assemble all their packs and goods and start up this trail towards the Yukon and the Kusala River. Here's John coming up at the beginning here. And you can see how steep it is right there, right up the road building, about a fourth. Here's a CMT, culturally marked tree, right there at the beginning of the trail. I think that was the forest that was spreading it. And then here, it, 
as we progress up the hill there, I stopped and snapped some pictures there, but it was, uh, we were marching pretty fast, and I was trying to keep up and snap pictures at the same time, so oftentimes I'd have to run to catch up with them, because I didn't have a gun. They, they had all the artillery. So, yeah. Here's just another shot of them. Uh, so, as we went up, it took us two days to go in there. we turn around and come back out. The next day, we get up and do the same thing. So as I was traversing the territory with them, uh, I was snapping pictures going up one day, and snapping pictures on the way back, and when we go up the next day, I'd snap some more pictures. And, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a bunch of pictures that, yeah, I just stopped and uh, snapped when I had the opportunity. Now here's the interesting, uh, it's kind of, you can see the birch bark in his hand. This is archeological find right here. Um, that piece of birch bark you see rolled up was halfway up what we call the canyon. And there was a CRT, a culturally marked tree on the way, which was a giveaway, and I stopped and looked at it. It almost looked like there was a uh, face carved into the tree. So the sap and such had covered it up over many, many years, decades. And that was what led me to walk around the other side of the outcropping, and lo and behold, inside there you could see the Birch Park rolled up like a bunch of dollar bills. And here's the actual little shelter area here. You can see the smoke stain on the rock there, the yellow, where they build the fire. And all these cedar bark, not cedar bark, but birch bark were rolled up like a bunch of dollar bills, and they had it all stashed inside the little cubbies and everything. So to any kind of weather they could come through there, they would know they could start the fire with the birch bark that was only there. So this was the halfway, about the halfway point. Glaive and Dalton, and they were guided through there. It's really interesting. Um, Glaive was a newspaper, man, and he was like, it was a torturous hike over the uh, over the trail and the gates, and he called it the Chilcat Gates. And he said it took us four days, and we camped out four times. And by the time I started the trail, you know, we could traverse it in one day there, so I was beginning to wonder that this was a true journalist. That was right in fact and fiction. <laughs> so yeah, it was real, real interesting to uh, go into these uh, places. He had written, you know, it was a good, it was a good account of his historic, his trip up there because he had, um, he had uh, the only information on this whole trail and it was good. Here's, uh, as we came out that, that first day, too, looking up, these are the actual stand of birch trees where they had taken the birch bark from, I'm pretty sure, and you can see that canyon back up in there. But really a nice, nice forest with the birch trees up there. Yeah, it's really a nice walk to when we started. Little, you can see those glaciers up there at one time. You can imagine over 100 years ago that they were converged and they were all the way down into the bottom. So in their time, you know, over a hundred years ago, that this is probably the glaciers we went filling up the valley. Let's see. This just shows some of the granite formations in the rock climbers uh, close right there. I'm sure somebody looked at that before us. I could scale that up. But uh, yeah, real interesting formation from the fractured shale of the south of us, present in the old Chilcat Valley that was all turns into solid and a whole different strata. And here's a, another shot of coming through a little pass on the way across the, uh, the canyon to show some of the uh, granite and formations and the trails. And interestingly enough, the trail was still present there. The game animals, of course, so as they came back and forth would help you know, keep it knocked down. But this was a the second choice uh, after the first trail was abandoned. I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get into the Tahini part of it. Yeah, here we are finally making the final push to get down to the opposite side of the canyon. They're going north heading towards the Yukon border there. So you can see the trail is pretty well worn. Now it's real interesting that at various places it was about, I figure, six to seven inches deep. 
you must remember that they had a hundred packets at a time at the time coming on this trail. Full load of 100 pounds of dried salmon and seaweed, seaweed for the trade. The interior folks were all going to run. So this trail was worn down to the moccasins. So to, to go that distance to where it fell in the forest was pretty interesting. And here's some of the uh, shots from the trail ahead. And I tried to clear it out as much and you know, maintain it, be, keeping it more visible. Here's some of the moss covered. And these trees aren't that old either. You can imagine what it was like back here over a hundred years ago. A lot of these trees weren't as big as they are. So it was more clear, obviously, the flood of waves. And there's a good indicator of how, just how deep the trail is there. There's moss and stuff like that. And actually, if we would have stopped, I could have put the crossbar and measured the depth of it. Next time. Yeah, the snow is not the uh, top of the bluff here in the way. Yeah, still on the trail on the top of this big rock outcropping. And it was just so beautiful up there with all the moss and the vistas and the senior shots for this. It was just a non stop. Uh, this picture's nothing for me. This is just a portion of the slides I got. See the gentleman way off in the, the center of the picture back on the trail. Now, here's the interesting tree. This is where this is it a uh, CMT, a you know, culturally marked tree, where it was. You can see the brown bear had its way with it. You know, from way up, you can just scrape that thing right down and make a sign, as far as we can tell. So we knew we were in his country, and I said, There's another good shot of the other. You can see the power behind these. And of course, the tree is debarked too, so maybe it's a combination of trail marker slash bear. Yeah. And here's another good shot there. You can see the gentleman in the far river. Get closer to the other side of the gates, the short gap gates. Now we've descended down into the other side of the canyon. And lo and behold, if you look <coughs> behind the gentleman standing there on the right, you can see a crystal clear spring. And this comes out of the hillside as clear as can be, as cold, and that's so refreshing when you're out there and you need water. And this was part of a really good stopping point for them. And you can see uh, the Chilcat Chil River here on the north side of the canyon. And as the Chilcats climbed up into this country here, they would get to this point up here, then they would cross to the west side, and they would stay on the west side because all the glaciers were pushed down into the uh, canyon here. So the actual glaciers themselves they had to cross over the face of the glaciers. A lot of the places that they got Chilcat glaciers the last time, it was, it was quite quite big back in the day, I'm sure. Just from reading the accounts of the recordings by the play. Here's a straight shot across the other side. In that canyon you see on the other side there, on the over that one hump there, that's a canyon that we were in the day before when we ran out of water and it was so rugged. You know, well, I could traverse the place the uh, younger gentleman <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a good lesson for them to see a different country than like the Glen Allen and where uh, their office is located. It's quite a rugged spread off with double bullets. Yeah, and here's another good shot. It shows the creek and yeah, the fresh water looking very northward there, up into the valley. And we were three miles shy of where the head archaeologist John wanted to go. So this is where they launched the drone and did a scout ahead of, it, ahead of us with a drone. And uh, yeah, they, they uh, 
get a better idea. Next year we're going to go back up there again and build up God. So he's, he's coming down again. So. Here's a good shot of those glaciers. You know, imagine at one time they were both uh, converged right there. They came down and dropped right into the valley. Here's another field where the trail just disappeared, and we just had to keep going and uh, got to the spruce trees where it's covered, and uh, we finally found the trail again. Yeah. See, you know, this is another shot of, you know, when I was coming back out, it took us two days to get through the canyon, and as we came back out, I found my photographic opportunities, it's just me. There's another good shot of the canyon and the glaciers. And this was a, uh, I soloed all the way out, and this was a picture of it, uh, uh, by myself coming out 35 miles down the river. Yeah. Okay, this is a good view of the uh, canyon that we were just at. So to the left is the Tahini. The Tahini River was the first trail up through the Kill Path. This is the trail route that they used first. And it was rather difficult. You would go up the Tahini for about five miles, then you would climb the final little pass to a big lake that starts up there. And that big lake, the drainage is called the Kusawa River, which drains into Kusawa Lake. But one of the big uh, Difficulties was it's like two tectonic plates, so one was higher than the other, which created a huge you know, waterfall up in there. So that was pretty hard to, to traverse with the uh, backpacks and full of fish and stuff. So this trail was abandoned. The Chilcat was uh, pioneer, the Chilcat River route was pioneer, so that's the one that they switched to. So they had one that was older than the other. So the Chilcat was the one that they finally. Uh, we started using it, so yeah, you can see the river flaps there. And then it just next down, you can see the canyon, real fine line up there on the right, and that's where we crossed over. Yeah, this just shows some of the uh, hanging glaciers in the area. Yeah, this is on the uh, this is on the riverboat ride up here. Let's see these pictures and uh, just show you what the countryside looks like. Now this rock here is called Turtle Rock, and this is what I used to navigate when I'm miles in here, and I can see this rock from the original trail of the Tahiti, and then we arrived there. There is a cave up there and I had a marked fish trap on this uh, cave at this rock. The fish trap remained there for a while, but then uh, somebody stole it from mm -hmm. like that. And that's, you know, in this part of the country we have a lot of people that have to move various multiple things from the graves and everything that finds stuff uh, like that. But it was there for quite a while. And I was up here uh, I was 20 years old when I first came up into this area here. So. And here's some of the towering peaks up there, hanging glaciers, and different angle. Okay, to the left here, this is the uh, river boat again coming up. And that is the gates, I believe, on the right there. Okay, there's the gate, right on the right. So, Turtle Rock is that prominent little rock on the left there, you see. So that's the way I used to navigate when I'm up around the country. I'll keep that rock in one place where I can see where we're going with the chill caps on the right. Okay, this is the Tahini side. This one goes to the left as we go up in here. Yeah, and then again, there's Turtle Rock right there. So the Chilcat Gate's to the right, and the Tahini is to the left, the original trail that they used. There's another shot of the valley there. It gives you the left and right coming up. Yeah, there's the 
Turtle Rock or whatever. So Mars. Okay, there it is. The left side is the Tahini. This is where we'll take him in these next couple slides here. Yeah. See, that's to the right of the Jim It gives you the perspective of what to look for when you go up in there. There's a little bit of a strata alongside the road. You can see how deep it's cut in. There it is. Yeah. It's really beautiful country. They're all pet rock and solid. See, we're getting closer. And then you see, uh, there's the view from the camp here. Now, if you look at this picture here, you can see our camp on the Chilkat River on the very left side of the flats. Turtle Rock is immediately behind us. And that's where we started from. I think we were open for seven days. There's another uh, shot down the hill. The gates. This is like the second trip. Yeah, you can see the bedrock is just it's massive mountains. It's just a little bit off. There's no rock shale like which is quite covered in areas from here to Haines. It's all fractured shale and stuff. It's turtle rock. Yeah, you can go back at the trail. It's John. See, there's a CMT right there. That was the, there's no telling how old that tree was there. Here's that uh, CMT, and behind it is that rock where we found the uh, birch bark. Yeah, it was a giveaway there. You can see if you look at it, there's a, what we thought was maybe a carving of the tree that the sap had come over, so it's pretty evident I backtracked and that's when we found the uh, birch bark there. Did you burn any of the birch bark to have a fire? No, no. It's all archaeological. We put everything back in its place. We didn't uh, remove anything. We just did a picture of it. Because there's no telling Cold Clux could have put that there. Oh yeah, you could get in trouble. There's a clear picture of that big uh, granite mountain there. Here's one of the hazards we had to go across here. Going back to the Chilkat side. Here's the canyon. I run down, down into the canyon, snap some pictures, and then run back up to catch up with the crew. And I, I had no guns, so I stayed pretty close and they were marching. Every tree that comes through this canyon comes out on the other side of the park and everything's stripped off. And so there's some stuff down there that I didn't get to see. You know, there's an upper uh, shot. And yeah, it's a good shot right there. There's a ride on the trail. There's some of the rock out the rock. And the iron is mineralized there and you can see the red so you know there's minerals in it. That's the red color. Here we make the descent to get down the second day on the down into the river. Yeah, it's just full of double clubs and balls. <coughs> you could probably I could walk about maybe 70, 80 yards and stop and wait and maybe catch up and then I walk again. Because they weren't used to this country, it was pretty hard. Here's where we descended and came down into the uh, river on the other side of the Chilkat Gates. There's their creek and it's taking pictures. This has really got interesting here is the curve, the BLM curve. Looking up north on the other side of the gates. Now, this is interesting here. This is when you're standing at that creek down at the bottom of the, you know, this big cave up there. This fit one of the uh, legends of the cannibal giant. 
as the Packers were coming across the pass and packing all the fish and everything. This just fit the story of the legends of the, the uh, cannibal giant. If you sat in that cave, we came out of Freshwater Creek, and you could see us from that cave right down there at the Freshwater Creek. So this was the fitting place for the cannibal giant to come running down and raid the uh, Packers with all the fish. This is just some of the stories and you know, legends and myths that they had that are, you know, who, who's to know this is, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Yeah, we have to go check this cave out because if the glaciers were such in that valley higher than whoever came through here to first had to seek shelter in that cave. So this is all unexplored areas. Nobody's, you know, there's no history behind this. So it's got to be over 100 feet across at the top. So this is one of our objectives, is to go uh, survey this cave for any archaeological evidence. So, yeah, really interesting area. Yeah, here's some of the rivers and the double clubs and over the trees. And this is a really interesting one. Uh, I'm not sure what this was here, but I'm going to some pictures of it. So bright, uh, one of the Jokap weavers said, you should have brought it down and could use it to dye the gold bowl. Yeah. <laughs> so it's now, wolf moss. Yeah. It's the wolf moss that they use to dye the children. I know that. Yeah. Uh, but this is different. This is something that we don't know that this policy we lost in history. It's so bright and vibrant. You know, if you dry it out and then use it to dye your uh, stuff. You know, it's, it's, some of the stuff isn't known. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Here's some of the lakes across the top of the canyon. Just a nice, peaceful area. Yeah, just fresh water everywhere, which is a good thing. Here's come back out again. Okay, now, this is a halfway point here. We're over at Kusala Lake, now we're on the north end of this picture was here, I think it's uh, just one that I didn't uh, place in there, right? But that's a 1963 vintage uh, freighter canoe. It was standard issue in the Yukon for the uh, RCMPs. So that's a fairly old canoe and it uh, gets us everywhere we need to go. I'll take it. There's another shot of a halfway point on Kusawal Lake here. And the lake is 50 miles long, so it takes, I think it took us about four hours to get back in there with that uh, canoe. But yeah, the country up there is just totally different than uh, the south end. There's a nice reflection shot where we stop to spend the night. Not that the daylight in the winter lake was seen in just 24. Dinner to bring the bears. There's a nice rock out rocking off the uh, east side of the lake there. You can kind of see the scale of what we're up against and how far it looked, you know, like 100 miles or so. It's so far. We stopped paddle for a while just to get some exercise. Which goes to the west of the Chilcat. 
you know, we camped out on a uh, river, river bar there, and we just split and we stumps on fire just to keep the parrots at bay. The biggest pair of tracks I'd seen in a long time on this, uh, this river bar. I didn't tell my friend that this was his first experience going that deep into the uncharted wilderness. So this bear would leave his tracks flat in the sand. He was so heavy, his, like his heels sunk in like this. Yeah, he was, so he was at least a thousand or more pounds. And then behind his tracks came the Wolverine tracks. So yeah, they were both traveling together. And uh, we were definitely out gun. We had no gun, unless you remember, so we were totally at the mercy of you know, whatever befell us. Yeah. This just shows some of the uh, river banks here. This is where we camped out of a big, bad bear that was leaving his tracks. It's a log jam. And this is where I came up here 20 years ago. We camped on the bank right there that you see on the far right. Camped out there before we hiked all the way up in there. I was, I was pretty young. Now, as you get up in there, we were so busy, I didn't want to turn my back for a second. The brush was so thick that there was bears everywhere. Now, this is the King Salmon and Sockeye Street. So it was, it was full of sockeye. So we were very careful. I didn't snap all those pictures watching my flank and making a bunch of noise and stuff. But, this is the Flammer River that comes in on the west side. You can see the bedrock. And it's a, like a plunge pool right there. But we ran into a uh, bunch of uh, hydraulic action where the actual, when the big lake and the interior flooded out and came south, busted through everywhere, multiple places. This was showing the hydraulic action of the rivers when they came to flooded the areas thousands of years ago. We ran into these big holes in the bedrock that were about six to seven feet deep with the, uh, they were just complete circles all the way down into the bedrock from the hydraulic action of the water. And we've been on both sides of the river. You know, this is, uh, I've been on both sides of the river here. And there it is from afar, the uh, Flemmer where it comes into the Tahini this is a king salmon, so you can imagine the king salmon at the height of the room just filled in there, spawning over all these bears get so big because they eat a lot of fish up there. Now here's looking south down the canyon when we just came up. Now you have to remember the we're up and down these little valleys that come up in here. If we happen to disappear, it would be really difficult for anyone to come in and find us. This is such a big country, and uh, it's you fall in the river or whatever. It's so just rugged country, and you got to be careful every you know, step of the way. And then we look out for bears too. We never wanted to surprise one. So this is really huge, huge uh, bedrock uh, outcroppings. The beach, if you want to call it, it's just like sitting down in a field of cannonballs. And there was not much rest. We had to come out of the brush. Get on the beach and you know, rest so we can see everything around us. Just a little closer, close up. And this is about as far as the sand would come up right here where the falls start right here. It just gets too, too steep. There's a good shot of the final cropping. Yeah, as we go up, I'm trying to record here. Look for bears at the same time. It's rather exciting. You know, this is a real interesting shot here. If you look at all these boulders up behind them, this is uh, looking to the east of the river, and to the back is where the uh, the water had come down this valley and piled up all these boulders on this uh, embankment right here. You can see they stacked them up pretty high and they're all moss covered now, but they can roll to ground it from quite a ways. It was a pretty neat, pretty neat area to see the geologic uh, hydraulic action of the 
water trying to use bulk or something like that. Yeah, really nice. It was just unbelievable. Prehistoric. You can imagine again, over 100 years ago, some of these trees weren't, but just shrubs in there. Here's a cave that's up there. There's archaeological evidence in it. There's a uh, place where they put uh, their sleeping quarters in there and kind of put a bunch of planks and boards that they made, made a sleeping area in there. And then there was another place in front of the cave that they used for cooking. There's some uh, raw hide in there and some other evidence uh, in there. But we didn't go in the caves just out of respect. People that have been in there. There's another cave down the way here that we looked at. Because Grandpa Bear could be right in there taking a nap. We didn't know we were so far. Yeah. And there's another picture of the flamer that comes in on the top heating. Just some real beautiful areas that uh, very few people. This gives you a good size here. Birch tree sitting in this boulder pile. And this was a big point that came out, and uh, we actually were on the upper side of this, so we, we camped out and slept on the bear trail because it was the flash spot. And the boulder was about as big as this building right here, the flat top. And we camped out right on the bear trail and you know, built the fire. Yeah, it was rather exciting. We took shifts to the fire going. If we heard anything, we'd wake up for some hours. Now, this here is, is a, uh, what we call the stone house. Now, there was various stone houses in the Klinkin, uh trail systems, from Skagway, the Chilku Trail, they had stone houses over there. This one here was the best stone house that I ever seen. And then the other stone houses up in the past, up in the Chilkat Pass, on the, uh, they call it Stone House Creek, but it's not actually on Stone House Creek. You have to go up Clear Creek, and what it actually is, it's a big boulder that looks like it has the gable ends of a house, but it's not. So, D. Laguna, if you ever read those books, that was the stone house they were looking for these books to, you know, they wanted to see the stone house, but it's various places and various names they use that term stone house. But this is the best one that I, I think it had ever seen right here on the history. You can see that big boulder cleaved in half and the water pushed it over and landed right where it was at. There's the back, we call them the windows. And also, if you look up there in the ceiling, you can see the smoke stain. So you can see down in there's a little depression where the uh, fire pit was. And this is the uh, Kilauea Clans fishing ground here. This was owned, operated by them for the key salmon and sockeye. Okay, here's the stone house. This gives you a good, good uh, idea of what happened here this big rock that was cleaved in house that actually created what they call the stone house. Yeah, it gives you a good, good idea how big these boulders are up in this. Uh, it's just super primitive uh, everywhere up in there. Because the roof's not going to fall out. Yeah, it's, it's quite a few tons. Yeah. There's another shot of the uh, boulders. You can see the trees back in there, how big they are. There was so much to photograph in there, I think I would have to go up there and spend seven days photographing you know, this whole area. And, uh, it was just, it was just down in, you know. And like I said, I was up there when I was 20 years old. And there was, there's more caves, more uh, stuff on the back side because we came up a little different route too. Here's the back windows again, I'm inside. Look, Real good defensive position, though you can imagine that they put logs in front and kept it so the bear could come in. Yeah, and there's my uh, friend Mike Bott. And he's six foot three, so I just had him kneel down. And I'm inside looking out here. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty good size. The stone house sheltered wow. really good. Cool. Okay, now this is another interesting. Uh, 
As you can see, it what looks like a cross at the top. You all see that red cross at the top? That's actually the hula wheel dorsal fin sticking straight up. Then the tail is the, the cross bars that are right below it. And then the head is depicted as a oval drawing down there. And at one time, I'm sure, there was eyes and the mouth that was painted on there. It was a red ochre painting. So the other, uh, when I did the slideshow at the Haines Junction for the Champagne Jack people, we had the guy enhance this particular painting on the rocks. And this was the uh, killer whale. Yeah, it's real, in its time, it's pretty bright, I'm sure. It's just there to mark in their uh, areas. There it is, uh, a little bit distance out. But this is another interesting area here, too. See the smoke stain from the fires? Okay, that smoke stain went out right there above his head. So you can imagine, right behind him was the painting, pretty close to the ground, and then in front of him, you can't really, really see it. There was another painting, but it, was, it had to be enhanced to see it. But you can imagine if they hung their fish up on racks up in this area here and used that rock in their fish racks right there, possibly to uh, dry their fish and process it right there. So it's, uh, you know, it's all history now. I'm just kind of going to imagine what it was like in the Tahiti. See, there's the other painting right there, right at the tip of the uh, I call that my double club of cutters that they're with the blade on. Yeah, double clubs are so thick you have to cut your way through it just like the jungle. And this interesting little, uh, I wouldn't say little rock, but it was a rock that was on the left side. It was rather thin. And we just left it right where it was at. And I'm not exactly sure what kind of rock it was or anything, but you know, we try not to disturb it. You know, and, uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, job. I had archaeologists spin up here checking things out. And, you know. This is some of the, uh, we're coming back out of the trail. And this is just the prehistoric looking. Uh, untouched uh, forest for the last hundred years. Yeah, just the uh, moss and wolf moss coming over there. See, there's a, this is the trail here. You can see how deep it is and how much it was used. This is the first trail, of course, of the Tahiti. This is the first trail they used. So yeah, I tried to get a couple snapshots in between watching the watching for bears and it's a live salmon stream right now when they're up there. And, uh, but interestingly enough, but when you turn around and I got a little aerial view, and it was as if I could still hear all the people fishing and talking and smoking fish and the, the sounds and the, you know, their still and stuff that was like the uh, echo of their drums and their songs too. It's pretty interesting. Think back and envision, imagine the sounds from way back. Yeah, here we're on our way back out. And, uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, we just, two days we hiked in, and, you know, it takes two days to come back out through the whole bear country and the sandwich. Uh, Mike, he's like six foot three, so he, I let him lead the way because he can see way up there and see the bear. <laughs> That's what I always told him. But yeah, he, he, he was a fearless and uh, just remember we had no guns. I don't know, I didn't see any bear pictures yet. Yeah, we didn't want to snap any. You know, we, we let them rest. Yeah, here's another shot of the way out. Yeah, here's some more hanging glaciers now on the way out. Here is the. Uh, the next part of the slideshow. This is Kusaval Lake. Takini. Takini. See, we were just in the Takini River south. And this is where the Chilkat Trail comes out of the Takini. And 
and the Yukon side of Kusawa Lake. Now, right here where this is the CAS262B1, some of the forest has been chopped down here with uh, stone tools. There's still, you can still see all the uh, chop marks on the trees with some other interesting archaeological things in there that we have to go investigate. Her, our good friend, uh, Sheila Greer, she was up in here and she told us some places to go check out. You know, they spent, I think, maybe four or five days up in there. So uh, we went up in there. And, uh, this is our next uh, survey to the north end here of the uh, Chilcat site. We're going to go up in, into the Takini drainage for four days, turn around and back out. Try to connect the dots too fast here in uh, our surveys. And this is the Kusawal Lake uh, bears here coming up as we're cruising down in the canoe here. We snapped which was a wildlife. Instead of speeding down the middle of the lake, we just kind of take our time and see everything and take pictures and enjoy the trip. Now this is an interesting picture here. Uh, this is from the Tahini. Let's see if the let's see if it's got the you know, or there it is. Okay, this is a little bit bigger than an eagle. Um, we're sitting in a boulder patch on the southern Tahini route. We had to come out of the brush and take a break. But this friend of mine, Mike, we're sitting in the boulder patch on the river just to take a break from the thickness of the brush. And he was made the comment, this place is so prehistoric looking, all we need now is a pterodactyl to come flying. <laughs> yeah. So about 60 seconds later, this big bird comes flying in there from the north glides over our heads and he's banking and turning and he has a split tail. And it's got this red color glistening off the, the feathers and everything red. It was just beautiful. I came in there and I had to go down the river a little bit and get to the left of it so I could get uh, without shooting the, the picture with the sun behind me, directly behind the bird. So I'd snap these pictures and we weren't sure what it was, you know, so I posted it on a bird site that we have on Facebook and a friend of mine, he's part archaeologist and he's a travel adventurer. And he looked for two and a half hours. He could not identify this bird. And it was pretty interesting to look at the uh, beak is half yellow, half black. The chest has T bars on it and feathers. Real interesting. So I just called it the Thunderbird. Just, just to call it the Thunderbird, yeah. because, you know, who's to say, you know, was this thing from Russia? Was it from, you know, the, the east or the west or the north? Or, you know, it's, it's really interesting mm -hmm. to think about it. But yeah, you can see his back tail feathers in a tight V, and his wings completed. Yeah, so it was really just a real silent bird. It was squeak or squawk or nothing, but evidently it was in there feeding on the sound. So, yeah. Now this bear here, this is of course on the two slice, switching the pitches around here. They tried to put a sequence of order that didn't happen. Got a whole computer with thin teeth. But this bear here, he was all alone on the bank of the, uh, the lake, the Kusawa Lake. So I shut the mortar down and we're probably about 50 yards out. And of course the bears are so shy sometimes that they'll just turn and go into the brush. But this bear is different. See, I should be able to um, go ahead here with it, show a little bit of the Kusawa Lake for cruising. Here he is, again. And it is so quiet out there, there is not a single noise, not a bird, not a plane, not a, nothing is absolutely quiet. And this bear is out there in, uh, in the middle of nowhere, of course. There's another picture of the mountain out there, Kusawa. Picture here of the, some of the rocks that are the big sheer mountains that are just coming up out of there. I forget the name of this one. We called it the uh, Eagle's Peak Nest. Um, yeah, beautiful sheer. Okay, here he is going into the brush. Yeah, you know, we just pulled up there and decided to leave. 
then let's see, let's the sunset. That's the sunset from the uh, Takini, where it comes into the uh, Kusawa, the end of the Chilkat Trail, where it comes in to the Kusawa Lake. Okay, now I gave him this big old hoo ho, and he stopped in his tracks, and he's thinking. He comes around, comes back out, and does that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was pretty interesting, you know. Out of all the sounds we used to scare the bears, this one called the black bear back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were just glad we weren't on the land, and you know, it was, it was curious. So. Where's my naive? Yeah, he was he was trying to get our scent, you know, to see if it, uh, yeah, get ready for. Beast. We have a pretty good reaction out of the pair, so we know that the hoo-ho oh, doesn't work all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's good. Yeah, it's Blackbird. Okay, this is towards the end of the deal here now. Stage picture. Yeah, well, let me tell you, I did a historical journey with these guys, and this is the key that was carved from the Yukon River. In that 12, 13 weeks of the canoe camp, we had the Yukon folks up there. Now, it was 12 to 13 weeks, and upon completion, when the canoe is done, you can paddle off this island in terms of civilization. We took all their cell phones away, we took everything away from them. They could have visitors, they didn't have soda pop. We called it drop on the pop. <laughs> yeah, so after about three weeks, we finally. Frost and Freight and Solar Pop, and it was a good day of celebration. Canoe <laughs> Camp. This is the canoe. Cool. This is the canoe that these kids made. Wow. So, years after this was completed, we had a whole other group of uh, uh, the Quanlan uh, Dunn and probably Tashani, Tahaltan, uh, various you know, clan members who paddled about 600 miles to go to Moosehide, which is on mm -hmm. south of Dawson City, mm -hmm. to this big celebration that they have down there every couple of years. But this was a historic journey. And this whole journey that we took in this canoe, I photographed the whole thing. So this is still on the route of the trade route, which we did 600 miles. So I have about, total, this is a whole nother hour of slideshow that would show the canoe and the journeys and the areas of Fort Selkirk. Some of you folks know the history of Fort Selkirk and the uh, Hudson Bay Trading Post. Oh yeah. Okay, Hudson Bay Trading Post. Very interesting story with Cole Klux and when he traveled that journey that we just took and then he came out, went down the Yukon River to Fort Selkirk and you know burned the trading post down. It was really interesting as we were Coming down the river, the uh, one of the premiers from Ontario or Quebec or something was opposite of us, and they 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 were across the river oftentimes, and we give this big old hoo ho on the river, and after a while we see them again after a couple of uh, miles down the river, and then they would hoo ho back. <laughs> so it was, it was one of the premiers from the east, nice. and we all gathered at uh, Fort Selkirk. The Hudson Bay Trading Post was burned down by Ku Klux and then it was a historic journey. We, we parked a canoe there and stuff and spent the night. But uh, we all circled up and we all introduced ourselves in the big circle. You know, there was probably about 25, 30 of us all together, including the uh, contingent from the, the Yukon side here. But when it came time to introduce myself, I said, I am going off to the I'm from the Chilkat side. I am here looking for Hudson Bay. So all the folks that knew that story of Hudson Bay trading post right there, they all left, busted out laughing because it was the Chilkats that came and put the stop to the Hudson Bay trading post. So they all they all really laugh about that. But this other slideshow that I could do sometime in the future here as my journey um, retracing the historic trails will be, you know, it's going to be like almost two hours if I include this whole journey down in the historical uh, 
first time in about 100 years a cedar clink of canoe had come down the river. So it was rather fun. And this canoe here, it's like 20, I want to say 28 feet. It holds about 13 people. We picked this canoe up when we got to Moose Island. We all packed it up the trail into Moose Island and uh, put it up on a big lawn up there by the, close to the sacred fire. But, yeah, very interesting. It's, uh, I must have probably 600 frames of the trip. So this is all part of the deal. So I have about, I want to say about 750 miles of the trail by water and some of it by land covered so far. So I'm just going to continue to uh, record and walk. And we did this all out of our own pockets. So yeah, it's just, I just like to walk in the forest and record and you know, just volunteer and share the history that's been lost for the last hundred years. Yeah, but yeah, this is the last, this picture here, we were coming into Fort Selkirk and the rainbows there, but as we were coming in, there was uh, thunder, there was lightning, and then there was rainbows and then rain. So it was a real, real, and the Fort Selkirk spirit dancers came out and welcomed us with a welcome song. So, yeah, it was pretty good. It was a really nice walk. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it. So that's it. Are those maps? If you want to yeah, and I, I have some maps here. You know, if anybody wants to uh, get the next photo, this one here, forward. Yeah, those <coughs> maps. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, if, anybody has, uh, if, if anybody has any questions or wants to know, go ahead.
the uh, Yana people call it, the wild celery, would get so high, then they knew it was time to go across the pass because the conditions were such that they could traverse on top of the snow in different areas in, in some of the pass. You know, the actual uh, Chilkat Trail is well up the pass that we now drive on too. That was a uh, well-used trail too. Very interesting. There's just so many different trails there. We'd have to sit down and I'd have to draw them all out and I got them all memorized. And uh, there's just, there's still archaeological evidence out there. I know where, uh, for instance, uh, Jack Dalton's black powder rifles are. I know where those are. And his, um, they're in the bottom of Kalani uh, Lakes. <laughs> yeah, a very interesting uh, story in all my historical readings and stuff like that. Uh, you know, they, they took a quick carved canoe from the south shore of Kalani Lake, got out quite a ways in the air and the wind took its toll and the afternoon came up and the swamp, you know, the, the afternoon the windstorm at the lake and uh, Glade and Dalton had to turn a canoe upside down and dump all the guns and cooking utensils, his compass, his sextant, all brass. Yeah. So that's all the bottom of the lake. <laughs> yeah, so the two black powers. So the canoe was sinking in and something. You know, uh, yeah, very interesting yeah, historical account that I know. How deep is that lake? Yeah, I'm not sure. We have to go in there with a magnetometer or telegram and find the black powers and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's not the only thing that's out there either. There's photographic plates and a pistol that uh, they, uh, his other trip that they took up there too. Schwatka, Schwatki, they came up three different times. So they found that uh, when they came up to Taku, that's a whole other story there. There's another archaeological site up there that I must go in with the Appen people and take them back in there. Pictographs on the paintings on these rocks that I haven't seen for over a hundred years ago that need to be recorded for time of racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it's a lot of homework. You know, that's what I did in the one time I read books, sometimes two of them at a time. Yeah, just uh, it's a lot of gathering. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So much. how when you drive down into that Haynes Junction. Yeah, so the story is from the geologists from way back. That was one of the things I heard from the people talking was that that was all an inland lake. And when it broke through, that's where you see all the uh, Tatsushini Alsek drainage, the, uh, the uh, Tahini, the Chilkat, uh, there's, there's a couple other big drainages that came out of there. But as you're going through uh, Kusawa Lake, you can see the old shoreline where the waves beat up there, probably a couple hundred feet up there. There's a whole bunch of evidence up there of uh, uh, water, hydraulic action, stuff like that. But yeah, that's a real interesting. And then there's stories of, uh, I don't know if you ever read the, um, the Courageous Adventurers of the Ghost Stagger Expedition. You ever read that one? The first time that the Clinkets had found iron and fashioned a dagger out of it, they journeyed from multiple clan members, came out of Klukwan, did an expedition up the Chilkat Pass, over the top, down the O'Connor, into the Tatsushini, down the Alsek. Uh, this was before Dry Bay. And Yakutawa settled and they they followed the coastline all the way to the Columbia, well it was maybe the Malaspina, whatever the name is up there, right there. The, the uh, EAC people they met on the beach right there at the glacier because they had their pedagogies and they came down and met them and traded. And then they gave them a tusk and then while the Clinkets were on the beach uh, as far as they could go, they built a fire there and they noticed that there was a 
piece of iron blowing in the fire. So they took that, it was from an old shipwreck, probably from the Jap Japanese or whomever. And that, they brought it all back to Park Lawn, but on the way, some of them fell through into a crevasse. So when the Iceman was found up north here in the Tet the Tatsushini Range, I was so excited because I knew the story. And it was possibly that it was one of the clinkets from that expedition that they found in that crevasse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, it, it is absolutely just, just amazing. But that's the courageous adventures of the uh, ghost dagger. That's a, uh, a uh, iron blade and then the iron handle to the skull carver on top of it. Yeah, it's a real historical commemorates the uh, first expedition from thousands of years ago or more. It would be interesting to carbon 14 that ivory to see just exactly how old it was that would give us the information on the migration and the time of their, uh, their uh, expedition and stuff like that from where they met the EX. Yeah. When they found a long person found, I thought it was Carbon Jamie. And you know, I told Johnny, quick, translate that, Kakashi song. Yeah. And he said, I can't translate it, it's Tachomi. Yeah. The song is Tachomi. So that's why I thought it was Papa Dini, because from the story I remember being told, it, he was on the ice, on top of the ice, uh -huh. when he was left by his nephews. Yeah, yeah, that's. But we don't tell all of the story. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they a lot of these. But yeah, when they found the skeleton up there in view, because it was on the trail. And you can walk from where the, uh, the Takini comes off the end of the Chilkat route, and you drop down into Kusawa, there's a trail that goes all the way to uh, the beginning of the Takini River that dumps into the, uh, into the Yukon River. So you could have walked all the way and then uh, built a raft and crossed over to the other side there to go to Huchiai, Dalton Pulse and all those places. It's uh, really interesting to, but that that was the, uh, it, as far as Chuck told me up there, that that was Kakistani because they knew the story too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've heard it down here the too. So that finally, if I put it together, this is, that's them. Yeah, because they, they found them up there. So uh, you should see the trails, both sides of the Kusawal Lake, the trails about that deep. And these were the whole routes, you know, of the interior folks. And, was, and that junction there at the Kusawa and the, the, the first Takini where it drains in, there's like a junction right there. You can go to Car Cross. You can go to Car Cross, come out at the end of the lake, and then go through the lake and you'll be at Car Cross. Or you can go take the, the first left when you get up in there bypass the Takini and go straight to Champagne. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's all these different routes in there that nobody's been on for the last hundred years, except for Patty Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a real interesting place. Um, yeah, it, it hats off to the Champagne Asia, because that's where all my data goes and stuff. And you know, they're, they're uh, mm -hmm. we're gonna just keep everybody you know, in the loop share as much information as we can. So, And I even went so far as uh, I did a line item budget for the uh, Rasmussen people and applied for a grant. And after about two times, I think I was turned down. I'm just, you know, we can do this out of pocket. I think we have to work on a project where you could take um, some young shell cats. Yeah. And open the trail or talk about that. Yeah, exactly. I, I would be. Uh, because um, on my show, Katie side, he was the caretaker of the Shumbu Katie house way back in Clockwell. He was the guy. He knew all the trails. He went everywhere. So, um, and I share those traits because I feel, of course, this route. I don't need a compass. I never used a compass. I just can just go and. and uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, I feel the, you know, the, that I know the routes and stuff like that, and it's, uh, yeah, because I've been, uh, 
spent a lot of time in all the southeast, south of us, all the way down to Ketchikan and almost all the islands. I was searching for the Grouse Fort where the final retreat of the Sitka people after the second engagement with the Russian people. I almost think I know where it's at because in the history books they came over that, of course, but to find where the Grouse Fort is, I think is what they call it. I think I know where it's at because I spent a lot of time in uh, Pearl Straits and hiking around. I called it uh, Seven Mountains in Seven Days. Yeah, I even been to Neva Lake, which is an archaeological uh, evidence found right there. I've been down on uh, Prince of Wales, where on your knees cave is, uh, been all around that. El Capitan, and uh, yeah, I've covered quite a bit of ground to take well, probably a whole lifetime to do a whole bit of Yeah, I've done quite a few different areas. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. Yeah, I can just go for hours. <laughs> Left this iron dagger on the beach with 